I don't think Doris needs much of an introduction. I think everyone is very well aware of Dor who Doris is. Um, she did her undergraduate here at Spree uh, and she did her 40th thesis in the first generation group uh, working with Martha, who many of you also know. And so after her fourth year thesis, she decided she wanted to do a PhD and she came and had a chat to me. Do you remember this conversation? <laughs> and, and she asked me what, what topics I had for a PhD and I said, oh, I had this topic that I, I've been looking for about a year to get a student to do and I'd asked two really, um, really quite strong fourth year thesis students where they'd be interested and they looked at me and thought, mm -hmm. and I never heard back from them. And I said, gee, you're interested in it? And um, Doris said, oh yeah, I'll do it. And uh, I think that's sort of trademark Doris. You know, whenever there's been things to do during her PhD and we've been looking for someone to help out, she's always been very willing to, um, to help out and volunteer to do things. So, and so this, this is a bit of a story about that topic. <laughs> there's been some trials and tribulations. But I think today we're going to focus very much on the tribulations. So over to you. Thank you for the introduction, Alisa. Um, before I start my presentation, I would like to take a few minutes to thank people. And I think most people here had a PhD or doing a PhD who share the same view as me. You get lots of help during your research journey. So I would like to take this opportunity to thank Len. Firstly, I would like to thank my supervisor, Alison, for her guidance and teaching me how to do a scientific research. Um, for your advice and uh, not to the right direction and all of your time is much appreciated. And I also would like to thank my co-supervisor, Steel Wenhan, for the endless encouragement, inspiration, ideas and opportunity he gave me. I'm very lucky to have you both as my supervisor. And in past few years, I had a chance to work with a couple of people doing experiments together. That was lots of fun. I also would like to thank Zhong Lu, Kai Wang, Xi Wang, and Dong Ling. You, I hope I was helpful when you guys need it because you guys were very helpful for me. At this moment, I get my thesis ready to submit. So I also would like to thank my proofreader team as writing the thesis is the part I had the most during whole my PhD. So thanks for all Yang Zi, Li Mei, all the accounts for proofreading my thesis. And special thanks to Ziv. Thank you for proofreading my thesis and answer all my stupid questions about lifetime, what's one sum for me, some difference. Thank you very much. Your advice is much appreciated. I also would like to, oh, <laughs> I also would like to thank um, like people's work. Doing research is uh, very hard to move forward without others' inspiration work. So I also would like to thank um, Zhong Ru's finding on the residue aluminium in AAO, Philip Hammond-Brahan on the hydrogenation passivation, um, Peja and Wang Xi on plating, Li Chen Liu and Big Wang Xi on printing the phosphorus on hard plate. And also last 300 references I got in my thesis. So thank you very much. I really appreciate we can I could have a chance to work with you guys. Not lunch time yet. Okay. So today my topic is anodic aluminum oxide for silicon solar cell passivation and mentalization. I will start with my presentation with the motivation why we're seeking and seeking an alternative for the real service passivation and real service design. Follow up, I will give an introduction of what's anodic aluminum oxide. Um, and how to apply anodic aluminum oxide for passivation and what's the mechanism and it can help improve surface, surface passivation on silicon solar cell. Later, I will touch on the metallization scheme of uh, AO can provide, such as localized contact, laser dope through AO, and selective anodization. I will end off my presentation with a conclusion. So why we need to find alternative material for real surface design? 
Silicon nitride and screen printing to alumina electrode has been quickly adopted into uh, industry after they first developed. And it's interesting, despite lots of uh, new innovative, uh, innovative way to do the uh, front service and rear service, silicon nitride and screen printing alumina electrode still dominate more than 60, more than 96 percent of the uh, market share. They both have a common to do a service passivation and other function, which I would call a multifunction layer. So for example, a silicon nitride, it can provide service passivation and as an anti-refraction coating. And the real screen printing alumina electrode, after firing, it can provide backsurface fields at the same time real electrode. They have one thing in common, they both provide passivation. Let's move to a high efficiency solar cell. There's a different type of structure. People use different material, different passivation layer to achieve a high efficiency. However, to analyze those structure, there's few things in common. They have a well passive service and localized contact. Try to reduce the recombination at a localized area and passive the the surface region to reduce the general value and surface recombination velocity. So to further improve the commercial silicon solar cells efficiency, it will be sensible to achieve a way to passive a real service of and form localized contact with a commercial viable weight. That's when we kind of propose a Nordic aluminum oxide. A Nordic aluminum oxide is a layer of aluminum anodized in acidic solution with an external electric field. The formation of a porous layer of aluminum oxide on acidic solution will result in the narrow pore structure. And this narrow pore structure can be controlled by voltage, concentration of electrolyte solution, and anodization tide. Just a bit of background of how anodization works. Once you apply the external electric field, the alumina start getting electron and forming alumina ion. The field, external electric field, driven the alumina ions and hydroxy ions to react to form alumina hydroxide. And with time, alumina would dehydrate and become alumina oxide. And this formation allows alum anodic alumina oxide film has a high amount of concentration of uh, hydrogen and store charge, which we could possibly to be used for passivation on silicon solar cell. I pretty much cover this slide. Um, so basically when the iron travels the in the end of uh, end of aluminium and silicon wafer, there is a, a bit aluminium rich layer, which you have a uh, lot of uh, aluminium surplus, and that's this layer, the barrier layer, contributing the store charge. Those porous layer, people might call it the hydrate porous layer, because the porous layer usually contains a higher amount of uh, hydroxy ion, which is a hydrogen concentration a lot. So people have done lots of uh, things analyze uh, MRA to analyze the, the porous layer. So we can see there is a high concentration of uh, hydroxy ion and oxygen ions in the AAO film, which is a porous layer. And you reach the, t the peak at the interface during the barrier layer. So at the beginning, we try to just uh, directly anodize a layer of alumina on silicon wafer to replace like PECVD alumina oxide or silicon dioxide as a passivation layer. However, when alumina fully anodized, 
the silica layer was, it doesn't stop, the current will suddenly shoot out the underneath of silicon will start getting anodized. And during anodization of a silicon to form anodic silicon dioxide, the oxygen bubble will form and form the gap between anodic aluminum oxide and silicon wafer. This funding results of poor passiviation compared to the thermal silicon dioxide. That leads, to, um, that leads to a conclusion. We need an intervening layer to stop uh, an aluminum continuous anodized to silicon wafer. So later we start putting uh, uh, intervening layer such as silicon dioxide, silicon nitride. At the beginning, I tried my experiments on the planar wafer with a lightly doped phosphor diffusion. So we found out after anodize a layer of aluminum on top of silicon dioxide, there is a 40 millivolt improvement as an average. Compared with uh, anodize a layer of uh, silicon nitride, without the middle of a neon step, there is a 47 improvement on the sample with an intervening layer of silicon nitride, which suggests anodization might work as a neon process if the annual process may not really required. Further move to the 5-inch commercial wafer, 1 to 3 on centimeter 5-inch texture wafer. There is a roughly 40 millivolt increment when anodize a layer of aluminum on top of 10 to 15 nanometer of thin silicon dioxide. And for silicon nitride structure, after a near silicon the five, 5 of a 5-inch wafer, the average in privacy is 690 millivolt. There's another 6 to 8 millivolt improvement on top after anodization even on the annual wafer. So this primary result made me to try to see if anodize a layer of aluminum on other material will give us the same result. So I tried to anodize on amorphous silicon, silicon oxy nitride. It's interesting, anodize a layer of uh, aluminum on top of silicon dioxide, silicon nitride, amorphous silicon. It improves the effective lifetime across the whole injection level, except for silicon oxy nitride. The anodized layer of uh, aluminum on top of uh, silicon oxy nitride, there isn't a significant improvement in terms of effective lifetime uh, in privacy. And those from the effective lifetime in the injection, in a function of a uh, excessive carrier concentration. After anodization at the high injection level, the lifetime is identical, nearly identical to the S deposition. So when people talk about passiviation, we always think about the stability. It's interesting to see silicon dioxide and silicon oxy nitride is much stable with time compared with silicon nitride. So for example, for this particular sample, after silicon nitride deposition, the implied VOC is 670. After forming a neon in 400 degree in forming gas for 15 minutes, the lifetime increased to 705 millivolt. After anodization, another 15 millivolt improvement on top of it. However, it kind of vary with around 60 days in the range nearly 20 millivolt. And every time after PLO image, the lifetime should jump back. So which we suggest, although this variation might be get recovered by light, which is kind of sensitive to the light. And compared to amorphous silicon, the variation is relatively small within the 5 millivolt, except the first PLO image makes the lifetime degrade, which suggests it might be 
the, de the amorphous silicon degradation is induced by light at the first PLO. And rest of a PLO it doesn't have a very conclusive result if it's a variation or just the major magnetic rod. So to summarize the AO passiviation, on the planar wafer, the improvement is much predominant. Like on the silicon nitride passivator layer, the general value can reduce from 20 to fatal end to a fatal end centimeter square. And in terms of implied VOC, can improve more than 30 millivolt. On the texture wafer, one, two, three on texture wafer, the improvement on the zinc silicon dioxide suggests uh, aluminum, the adontic aluminum oxide could provide a hydrogen source and also enhance the passivator state, the st density state at the interface. So we're going to look at the what mechanism to allow an anodized layer of aluminum on intervening layer could result in proof of effective lifetime in private VOC. We were looking into the store charge within the anodic aluminum oxide. And it's interesting to see, compared to reference <coughs> sample, anodized layer of aluminum on top of a silicon dioxide always results a higher store charge density compared to reference sample. And however, people might wondering, if you have a 200 nanometer of an intervening layer, after a node has a layer of aluminum oxide on top, the field effect induced by the store charge might be relatively less. So we start to research how much hydrogen content within the anodic aluminum oxide? This is a zinc measurement, which is very similar to the literature has been shown. There is a high concentration of uh, hydrogen ion stored within the AO layer. And it's interesting to see if we anodize a layer of aluminum in deuterium deteriorated electrolyzation, electrolyte. There is a deuterium ion detect in the AO layer, which suggests the hydrogen source actually is from the electrolyte solution during the anodization. We further to see if we can try to quantitate the amount of uh, hydrogen introduced by anodization. For reference sample, which only have uh, amorphous silicon without any anodization or ev evaporate a layer of aluminum, the concentration is close to 10 to 21. However, after anodization, there is a 1.5 times increment, and especially anodized in the deuterium, deuterium electrolyte solution. After anneal, we can see the hydrogen ion and deuterium ion being redistributed. At the interface, there is a peak of the concentration of hydrogen, which indicated hydrogen or deuterium ion introduced into the amorphous silicon by anodization is passive at the interface. So we further doing this analyze on the commercial wafer with only 10 nanometer of a zinc silicon dioxide passive air ball surface and anodize a layer of aluminum on top. We strip of uh, anodic aluminum oxide and zinc silicon dioxide to detect the boron concentration within the wafer. And we can see after anodization, the first seven po first 
0.7 micron of uh, boron being deactivated at the interface. And after a near, this hydrogen being redistributed nearly into the wafer, more than 2 micron. As we can see, the, the boron concentration is slowly coming up to the anodization, the background doping level with the sputtering time increase, with the etching time increase. So to summarize, the hydrogen content in the underlying amorphous silicon air was increased by a factor of three after anodization. And hydrogen incorporation during anodization can deactivate recombination active defect at the crystallized silicon interface which result in improvement on effective lifetime I present earlier. A new at 400 degree after anodization can result in increased hydrogen concentration and redistribute the hydrogen, hydrogen to passive air at the interface. And AO can act as a hydrogen reservoir about to supply hydrogen to underlying substrate with di at a different stage. So after the passiviation mechanics and, and the ability to passivate silicon solar cell has been confirmed, we start looking into the metallization scheme. How can AAO help as for real metallization? So with the AO template, it could help to form the localized contact with its power structure. And the high concentration of uh, aluminum within the AO layer could provide a doping source for laser doping, for example. The way to form AO anodic aluminum oxide allows it to be prepared to form a conductive region and passiviation layer by one metal deposition. And this process, uh, we, I call it selective anodization. So we're going to look at, the firstly, the AO point contact scheme, and then laser dope through uh, anodic aluminum oxide, then finally selective anodization. This TEN image shows um, aluminum at the peak or valid of the, tech, the pyramid has uh, aluminum can penetrate into silicon dioxide by firing at 800 degree in bell furnace. Although it hasn't touched the silicon, however, this is the first TN image to drive this area to go forward. And later, John Ru find out at peak or valley of a pyramid, there is a residue of aluminum didn't get completely anodized during anodization. And which is this later during the firing, firing through the zinc silicon dioxide and make a contact with the aluminum. However, a thin layer of a Although a thin anodized layer of uh, aluminum on top of a thin silicon dioxide can improve the uh, implied velocity up to 660 millivolt from 600 millivolt, the strong inversion layer created by the store charge within the AO layer. And also, this residue aluminum can only form 0.2 microns of uh, Bexus fields. Results very poor. IQE and EQE response at a long wavelengths. And this research leads to an important question. The importance to form the localized basis fields with very small scale contact need to at least have a two micron thick of a basis, the basis field to result a good efficiency. This leads to the research to laser dope through AO user aluminum as a dopant, 
wishing na ano dek aluminya oksa. At the beginning when I play around the velocity of the laser speed, I achieve the lowest shear resistance around 6 ohm per square at 500 millimeter per second. To further various uh, power and the number of a scribe, the lowest shear resistance of a two micro two ohm per square can be achieved at a nine watt and scrapped twice. It's interesting to see after remove the AO layer, the shear resistance jump up to M ohm per square, which suggests the aluminum the segregation coefficient C in silicon is result in this thin layer of aluminum at the interface. After removal AAO, this thin layer of aluminum was removed and result in an increment of uh, shear resistance. By varying the laser speed and the laser power, the laser dot line is in the, reach, in the range of uh, 16 micron to 20 micron thick. Studying the laser dope through AO, the damage induced by the laser process was also being investigated. It's interesting to see at the beginning using the 11 watt results a um, higher voltage in privacy voltage lost. However, this loss can be quickly recovered by a new step compared to the high laser power. And to further reduce the laser damage, move from the light contact to point contact can result nearly within the 5 millivolt loss of a point contact. So in this image, each of the dots is copper plated point in contact by laser dope through AAO. And compare this to PLO image before the laser doping process and after, there is no significant drop in terms of a PLO count. And on the symptom bridge major the implied VOC, there is only within 5 million volt difference on when laser dope through AO to form a point in contact. The lower shear resistance was achieved by double scribed at a, a laser speed of 500 mm per second and 9 watt. However, the number of scribes increased the laser damage. So to find a way to dope the laser dope through AO, which can result in higher doping concentration with less damage, was investigated. AO can be doped with other impurities, such as uh, boron and phosphor, by anodizing in, in the electrolyte solution containing the extrinsic impurity in ionic form. So Thompson has uh, suggested when anodized uh, aluminum in a boron contact in electrolyte solution, there is a 0.4 depth of uh, boron incorporated in the AO films. However, if anodizing in a phosphoric acid, there is nearly 75% of a phosphor incorporated in the AO film which suggests uh, anodic aluminum oxide can be doped with a different impurity. And during the laser doping, aluminum and other impurity can be doped into silicon. This co-doping process can be used to create a very heavy doped surface layer underneath of silicon. Um, the zinc profile of a laser doped region is this measurement was done by laser dope through uh, two, two centimeter times two centimeter of a laser squat. The borons being on boron 
was used as a reference to do the comparison between the boron concentration and the doping level. We can see the laser dope through AO, which is anodized in the combination of a phosphoraxy and boroaxy. I will call this as a boron doped AO layer. And the least one is anodizing the phosphoreaxy, and I will call phosphoridopt AO layer. We can see the aluminum concentration is significantly higher. For the one, anod for the one laser dope through the phosphoridopt AO layer, the aluminum concentration is above 10 to 20, up to 8 micron depth. This difference in the aluminum concentration was quite similar with the funding Nagel has absorbed. He proposed the aluminum solid state diffusion coefficient is increased in the presence of a phosphor because the phosphor induces a fuel assistant aluminum diffusion to help aluminum diffuse into the silicon wafer further. When we continue to analyze the diffusion, pro the laser doped things profile compared with those diffusion profile in literature, it's very interesting to see some similarity in between. Kruman <laughs> suggests when another when diffuse aluminum in the presence of a boron, the aluminum diffusion is enhanced by a factor of a three. And he proposed it's because the super saturation of a self initial of a boron and aluminum. Therefore we can see in his funding, without the boron presence, the aluminum depth is only 0.8 micron. With the presence of uh, boron, the aluminum depth increased to 1.2 microns. It's very interesting to see the shape of uh, laser doped through boron doped aluminum region in relation to the diffusion state of a chromium found. Also, we almost have a flat region and first dip at a point first 500 nanometer, although the two graph is different scale. This finding suggests doped aluminum can doped anodic aluminum oxide layer can enhance the aluminum diffusion into the silicon wafer by the presence of a phosphor or boron. The ECV results confirm the active, active p-type of dopant within the a laser dope through AL region is much higher than the laser dope through the standard bo spin on boron source. And spin on boron source introduce loss voids when the laser power is high and the lower laser dope speed. However, laser dope through anodic aluminum oxide doesn't have a this type of problem. The laser dope region usually very smooth and there is no much defect along the side. So I've been making the cells with this type of uh, measure. And it's interesting to see the doping introduced into the AO layer could result a difference in the fuel factor and series resistance. So the fuel, the series resistance is reduced when I using the doped, boron doped AO layer as a doping source for laser doping process. This suggests with this type of boron doped AO layer allows the laser doped line be further apart and 
which could result a higher open circuit voltage. So the formation of a localized of P plus region can be achieved by laser doped through AO. And anodic aluminum oxide layer can be doped by boron or phosphor by anodizing different electrolyte solution. This co-doping process can create very heavy doped local region with a concentration of 10 to 20 for first four microns. Laser dose through AL can perform without the introduce any voids within the silicon. This could be advantage for plating or other process such as forming by facial solar cells. And the local doping method make fabricate a per cell result in efficiency up to 19.9 with a reduce of uh, series resistance to 0.54 ohm centimeter squared. So now I'm going to move to selective anodization. This is a bit of a different concept with the previous proposal to measure. Selective anodization is to form a conductive region and anodic aluminum oxide, which is a passivation region, by one metal deposition. So it involves the two steps. Firstly, patterning aluminum before anodization, and then anodize. And patterned aluminum has been done by in many ways, such as the file measure, or simply screen printing the agent to H aluminum to celebrate two conductive regions for IBC cell, for example. And this selective anodization is possibly provide a passiviation, dopant of source, conductive region by one metal deposition. So the patterning method can be seen as a masking method or isolation method. In this presentation, the rest of the result was done by masking measure or isolation measure. Masking measure is to cover the aluminum by either of a photoresistance polymer or silicon dioxide. <coughs> which the layer during anodization was covered. And after anodization, the cover region, the region underneath of a cover region remains as aluminum and everywhere else is anodized. Isolation method is to isolate aluminum into different regions. So for example, in this figure, the middle part remains as white because during anodization, the electric field was interrupted and this region has been isolated. The effectiveness of a masking measure is rely on the surface of aluminum and also the duration of an anodization time. By printing a novel, the blue resistance on sputtering aluminum results in perfect adhesion after anodization. However, it's not an evaporate aluminum. Therefore, I was trying to find a measure can form a mask on top of aluminum, which you can apply onto sputtering aluminum, evaporate aluminum, regardless of aluminum surface and anodization time. By printing 50% of phosphoric acid, on top of a heated silicon wafer up to 200 degrees. The phosphorus acid dehydrate to form the phosphorus oxide and react with aluminum to form the mask. And this mask is in a composition of uh, aluminum phosphate. During uh, anodization, this aluminum phosphate going to act as mass on top of uh, aluminum as a mask. 
So when I try to analyze the masking measure on the at the mask area, underneath of aluminum was remain as a metallic aluminum as sure as a red light. And on top, we can see there is uh, aluminum and also the phosphorus. This phosphoric axis printing on a hard plate can vary by the printing condition to change the width and also resistivity. By printing the one, two, three layers of uh, phosphoric axis on evaporated aluminum, we can see the resistivity of the aluminum fingers remain within the 10 to minus 5 on centimeter. And the width of the printing the aluminum finger is in from 40 micron to 117 micron. Masking measure is relatively easy to achieve as the number of layers required is within 1 to 3. The isolation measure is to isolate aluminum into different regions by printing 50% of phosphoric acid without any heat treatment. Therefore, allow the phosphoric acid to etch aluminum. This measure, by etching the aluminum to isolate different regions and anodized, we form the each of uh, isolated aluminum region as a conductive region. However, isolation measure requires a larger amount of printing layers to etch through the aluminum to form each individual aluminum finger. As this uh, SEN EDS um, analysis shows, and the H line of uh, next, the H line of uh, isopher region, the first ferroxy was etched through the aluminum and underneath of silicon nitride has been shown. So by line scan of this area, the aluminum concentration suddenly dropped at the least two isolation lines. By measuring the conductivity of uh, this aluminum finger, the isolation measure results a lower resistivity compared to masking measure because this isolation aluminum region didn't react with electrolyte solution at all. So the conductivity of this isolation measure is very similar to the reference value. The masking measure and isolation measure has a different advantage and a disadvantage, and it could be used on a different cell structure, such as masking measure can be used on the bifacial solar cells, which is relatively fast and easy. And isolation measure can be used on the IBC cell structure, because the isolating two regions, which could effectively avoid shunting. The IBC cell structure was proposed with uh, using the AAO as a doping source. So by isolate, isolate aluminum into different regions, the aluminum can remain as a conductivity for the N plus finger. And then P plus semiconductor finger can be achieved by using the aluminum and boron within the AAO as a dopant. Although the shoe resistance of a P plus semiconductor finger formed by laser dope through AO is relatively small. However, with the large uni cells, the series resistance could still add up a lot. This could be solved by plating up the bus bar in a two level grid. During plating up the bus bar, the each individual of a P plus semiconductor finger can be played as is quite conductive 
the shear resistance is quite low, so it's, it will be relatively easy to play it up. Um, to conclude the summary, the selective anodization part. Selective anodization of alumina can be used to form a pattern of a dielectrical layer and metallic region by one metal deposition. And it can achieve by either using a masking method or isolation method. A selectively anodized layer of alumina could result a multifunction layer, which provides surface passiviation, a source of dopant and metal contact skin. So to conclude my presentation, a node as a layer of aluminum on top of an intervening layer such as silicon dioxide, silicon nitride, and amorphous silicon result in an improvement on surface perturbation, which reflect on the implied VOC and zeno value. The formation of uh, AO can enhance the hydrogen perturbation by providing the hydrogen incorporated during anodization which can be released by a neo or a neo process into the silicon wafer. The ability to form the P plus region by laser dope through AAO by laser dope through AAO to form the heavy dope P plus region can be even enhanced by dope the AAO layer first with a boron or phosphor. Mm. And two selective anodization, different anodization method is proposed here. So in my PhD, I tried to apply this into the real surface design of a silicon wafer. However, it doesn't really restrict to the silicon. As a uh, anodic aluminum oxide has a very different different function to provide as a doping layer, doping layer, and passiviation layer. And the way to form it, it could combine all the different function of uh, anodic aluminum oxide into by one layer of uh, metal depositions. Thank you for your time. Any questions?